if for some reason I need to do something prior to the input transform, you still can. You know, in, in this structure, there's nothing prior to that first node. It's literally, it's inaccessible. Hi there. In this video, we're going to discuss options for building a node structure and applying the color management theory that we've discussed in previous videos. So let's get into it. Right, so finally, after all that theory, we're down to doing some grading. We need to look at our node structure, and I'm gonna give you some advice, basically from more complicated to more simple, and you need to choose a node structure that works for you, and a color management method that works for you. In terms of our node structure, we obviously need to meet all these workflow criteria about sizing. We might be shooting four by three and we're gonna crop it to a letterbox or we're gonna crop it to 16 by nine or all these different things. So scaling is an issue. Um, color management is a big issue, which is the whole pipeline, the whole, whole job. We're gonna design a show light. We're gonna maybe put grain or texture and we're gonna be doing scene by scene looks. So going from broad to finer and finer uh, sub small sections of detail. We're going to be doing shot by shot matching. We're going to grade fine details within each shot. So going from broad, you see how this is getting finer and finer. And then once the fine detail is done, then we do different versions. We go to TV, we go to cinema, we go to HDR, web, cell phone, etc., etc. The plethora of, of deliveries. And then obviously we deal with con changes and contingencies. So the node, ideally your node structure should be able to deal with all of that if you're working at the highest end or a way simplified version if your requirements are very simple. So know your requirements, it solves all the problems. Why use a fixed node structure? Because it's easy to ripple things. You make changes, you work through a hundred shots, and then you decide to make a change or the client decides to make a change. And you can, because of the common node numbering, you can ripple that change through to all the other shots without having to go applying them one at a time. So this is roughly the, the node structure that I work with. I have my input color management and then some noise reduction. Then I will do shot by shot matching. So that's every shot will have a little tweak if it needs it. Scene by scene. So the day scene, the night scene, at school, at home will have its, its, might have its own tweak. And that'll be all the shots within that scene. There'll be fine details in a parallel section. Texture, I like to apply texture first before applying the look. So it also goes along with the, through the color, the color journey as it is. The show look itself, it normally comprises of three components, matrix and HSL uh, transforms, a 1D tone curve, a split toning, and then I always liked, you know, versions and trims. I leave a few extra nodes for contingency. And then obviously the color management, the output transform to go out to our various display types. Now, if you're going to be doing project-based color management, it's going to be overarching and it's going to be outside of the color page. So you're going to be in this situation. You don't need a node to do input. You don't need a node to do output, but you do need to go into the color management in the settings page to set up your color management how you like it. Either automated, which I don't personally don't trust, or the foot you can go into the custom mode and you can set all these details, the input, the timeline, various luminances, the output space, any limiting, and what type of display transform and color science you're gonna be using it at each stage. But like I say, I like to use um, node-based management because if for some reason I need to do something prior to the input transform, you still can. You know, in, in this structure, there's nothing prior to that first node, it's literally, it's inaccessible. Whereas here, I could theoretically, if I really needed to, I could do something prior to this node and I could do something prior to that node. So yeah, maybe that's a good thing for some people, maybe it's a bad thing for other people, but those are the pros and cons of node-based versus project-based. Node-based, you have to manage it yourself. Project-based, it's kind of done for you, but you also still have to be very careful. Just roughly a visual representation of the, the three components that I mentioned for look design. We have 3D matrices, the various hue versus hue, hue versus sat, and all these um, what I call HSL curves or HSL transformations. Very important to a look is the contrast curve, a 1D tone curve, which is typically our S-shaped curve, which has come to us through hundreds, you know, more than a hundred years of film, photography, 
um, and general image making. And color washes, you know, it needs to look cold, it needs to look warm, or it needs to have split toning for a particular artistic effect. So these are the broad three categories, and we'll go into this in detail on, uh, on other videos. So yeah, let's look at some images finally after all that theory. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Too much theory. Okay, so what do we have here? This is my standard note structure. Now, what I'm going to show you is from, let's say, I know people who do way more complicated than this, but let's say this is complicated. So as you can see, I have my color management in the front. This is going from my camera space, which is Arri Wide Gamut 4, Log C4, to my working space, which is DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate. Again, always two things, gamut and transfer function, gamut and transfer function. Through my node tree, I've got shot matching, scene matching, or scene looks, should I say, characteristic of a scene, like a cool evening, a warm afternoon. This parallel stack, I do fine details, you know, a window on a face, uh, keying the, the leaves of this tree, etc., etc. This is my texture section, then my three components of my look, my HSL and matrix, my 1D curve. I do, in this node tree, what I'm using is the film verse to do everything, but uh, let's just say it's acting as the 1D curve, it's in the position of the 1D curve. I, Prior to my 1D curve, I do like to have an, a node that can do highlight roll off, because nowadays with high dynamic range cameras, highlights are, are a big issue. It's, no, it's not something that you can uh, ignore and just leave to the color management to do. You often have to do uh, manual tweaks yourself. So then, yeah, my split toning and any clips and a contingency node, and there's my output transform, which is going from DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate, to Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4. Now, I would always, I like to, when you put these color space transforms on and use DaVinci Tone Mapping, normally these ticks are grayed out and it does it for you. Based on what you select here, it'll give you a, a, a good solution. I like to open this up, especially working in HDR projects, and I need to check and choose the mapping carefully myself. So what I wanted to do is I want to go from 10,000 nits, which remember we saw the specification of DaVinci Intermediate, it goes all the way up to 10,000 nits. I want to take all of that and I want to tone map it down into my output gamma 2.4, standard definition has a peak white at 100 nits, and I want a soft roll off. And so I set my output to 100. There's adaption, which you can also adjust, but be very careful. Um, it has implications if you're doing multiple versions. And then I personally like to control extreme saturations. So I would always put on the saturation compression here. You'll see in this image, if I show the vector scope here, because I've already created a fairly muted look no high saturation. You'll see that if I take this off, it only there are only some of these cyans that are being affected, but it's a good safety net and it's a good a nice way to give you a kind of a smoother, more controlled color gamut, especially at the extremes. Right, so let's say this is our complicated one for people who know what they're doing, who need to do lots of details, they have demanding clients, and they might be doing multiple versions. But let's simplify. Not everyone needs that to be have things that complicated. So We'll take it a step down. We've obviously still got our color management in, our color management out. That never changes. In between is all DaVinci wide gamut, DaVinci intermediate. We're still doing shot matching. We still have scene looks. We still have localized detail, but our look is way simplified. I'm not doing any texture. I don't need to soften and sharpen things. I'm not adding grain. It's a very realistic show. Let's take all of that out, simplify things. So all my HSL could be one node. I could have a highlight plus the 1D tone curve, split toning, a safety node for anything at the very end, and then my um, output transform. So way simplified. If that's what works for you, then do that. Even simpler. So we might still have the scene, the matching in the scene, and say it's a long job, limited time, low budget, and you've negotiated with the client to say, Look, based on what you can give me and based on the time available and the number of shots, let's just make an agreement up front. No details, no windows, no keys. I will use primary and secondary corrections on a global, you know, on, on the whole shot, and I'll do my best in the time. And that's the criteria for the particular job. So 
a way simpler node structure. You still can use the more complicated node structure just in case, but in terms of what's actually getting used, the, this is, and you, you could, you might find that this works for your level of production. So we can go even simpler. So let's say something that's really simple. So no brainer, you're not gonna be windowing anything. You've got to work fast and it's mostly consistent. So you might have a, a matching node shot to shot. Obviously, you're still encompassed by your input and your output color management. You've got one node to create your look in. And now I'm using the film verse. You can see I've done a lot of tweaks. It's now zigzagging backwards and forwards. I've, I've, I've built a slightly more muted look, which has got a strong contrast. And I've made the drop the luminance of some of the colors with these with these density sliders. But it doesn't have to be that way. You know, I mean, I, I could save this. I could say right i'm going to use this one uh, let's say this is my look and i'm going to build contrast so i'm just going to use the bulk standard s curve contrast i'm going to build it to my liking and i'm going to move the pivot point just how i like so the very just simplistic we're not even getting into the the mid gray points of any color spaces and any any fancy stuff like that we're just going to add some contrast we might do some color washes, cooling the blacks, warming the tops, and we want to desat slightly. Done. That's it. That's our look. And we go. It's a simple job. It's a maybe a simple cor corporate video, a wedding video for your aunt, or you know, something that just needs to be done quickly. You don't need to kill yourself with detail. And this is it. Color management, one node for the look, and a node that you can do matching on. It's fine. It's got to be suitable for the job. In the questions on the previous video, some brought up the issue of ACES. Now, if you're working in a, a project that requires uh, using the ACES color management, and especially if you're tied into using the ACES output transform, if that's a decision that's already been made and everyone, you know, all the, the heads of department, the camera tests have been done and everyone's decided, yes, we definitely we like the ACES look and we want it as our um, as our output transform, then you would work in the following way. You wouldn't use the CST. You see, I've turned it off. You could delete it, but I've just turned it off so you can still see where it would be. It now gets replaced by the ACES transform. Now we find the ACES transform in the effects library here. It's the first, because it starts with an A, and uh, resolve FX color. And you chuck that onto this input um, transform node here. And I've changed the label ACES IDT input transforms. That's that's really the the ACES terminology. And you'll see that on the settings, we just have to choose what camera is. So our input is coming from ARRI log C4 and our output is to ACES CCT, which means that all these nodes here are in ACES CCT. So here we go, wonderful. We do our matching, we do our texture, we start making our look and we want to use Filmverse. So what do we do? Filmverse expects DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate. So we need to sandwich it between two nodes, two, two color space transforms that are going to go from ACES, CCT, into DaVinci um, Wide Gamut and then back afterwards. So the first one is going in the forward direction. We go from ACES AP1, ACES CCT, to DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate. So now we're speaking the right language for Filmverse. And there you go, they're all my settings, exactly as the same on the previous shot. Going out, we go back. We go from DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate back to ACES AP1 and ACES CCT. And you'll note in both cases, there's no tone mapping because these are both wide gamut working spaces. They do not need any highlight roll off and no, no OOTF forward or reverse needs to be applied. And so we're back in CCT, we carry on and our output transform now is replaced. We're not using the, the color space transform native to resolve. We're using their implementation of the ACES output transform and we tell it our input is coming from ACES CCT because that's what we, we're in and we're going out to Rec 709 and there we go. Now, for those of you that are paying attention to the look, you'll see that that's the normal look that we had using DaVinci color management. And now this is the look using ACES. It's different, the look's different. I've applied the exact same settings in Filmverse, but the output transform itself has different creative decisions built into it. It's not just a technical transform. Um, the whole ACES premise was built on the fact that as a default state, we wanted something close-ish to 
the typical print, you know, Kodak film print, the cinema print, uh, S curve plus um, saturation and all these other characteristics. So by default, it's built in together and you need to, if you want lower contrast, you need to work against that. So as an example, if I liked, I had to use aces, but I wanted lower contrast, I could prepend or put somewhere in my node stack a node that, that did this and took some contrast out. You'll see it's not exactly the same. It's a, it's a pretty complex curve that they're doing inside of their um, what's called the RRT, the, the rendering transform. And it's very hard to just with lift gamma gain or with an S curve to back out of, but you can get something close. That's your skill, skill as a colorist to get somewhere close. One more option on the ACES front. If you are getting footage in from VFX vendors in ACES format, in ACES linear and AP0 or ACES CG, any of these interchange formats, you will need to use the ACES transform up front, especially if you're getting film scans in ADX, ADX 10 or ADX 16, you will definitely need to use the ACES IDT at the beginning. But if it's up to you how the output transform and all of that gets done, and if you choose to use DaVinci's, then straight after this, you can go from, use a color space transform to go from ACES AP1, CZT, over to DaVinci Wide Gamut, and then your pipeline's exactly the same as we mentioned before. And you'll see that this version is exactly the same as just using DaVinci Wide Gamut. So mostly, um, there are some slight exceptions, but mostly these color space transforms are totally reversible. When doing node management like this, one important thing to note is that in the project settings here, you go down to color management, you'll see color space and transforms. It's very important that you must set your timeline color space to whatever space you're working in. And here we've been talking about DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate. This will affect the scaling on some of the tools that are color space aware. The other option that we discussed was this, this ACES CCT. So you might choose between one of those two. And then also it doesn't affect much in the grading controls, but it does affect metadata on exporting. So I would always also, just as a good habit, set this Rec 709 Gamma 2.4 in our case. Another thing to note is if you're using fixed node structures and you want to do rippling of nodes, which you definitely will want to do because of, for the time saving, is in this, the preferences up here, if you go over to user and you go to color, most important is this middle one here, preserve node numbers when adding nodes. This must be ticked. Otherwise, every time you add a node, all of your nodes get renumbered based on the, the, the signal order, and we do not want that. Otherwise, we cannot ripple nodes effectively. And then my personal preference is to have these two on. Previous or next node navigates only to correctors and always perform copy and paste on selected nodes, just to kind of a, a legacy option. I always have those three ticked. Hopefully that was a useful introduction to building a node structure that's suitable for different types of jobs. So go out there and have fun with it and looking forward to your questions and we'll see you on the next one.